Hi, I'm Tamara, and this is Telus Talks with Tamara Taggart. Hi, everyone. The world needs more empathy. That's what author, professor, and empathy expert Anita Novak believes. She's here to talk today about her new book, Purposeful Empathy. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hi, Anita. How are you? Great. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited about this because I've never had a conversation, I don't think, with somebody about empathy and purposeful empathy. So you have a brand new book. Yes. You have it with you. There it is. Purposeful empathy. So what is purposeful empathy? Well, I guess you need to take it a step back and just understand the frame of empathy. So there's a lot of words that are treated as synonyms like pity, sympathy, compassion, and empathy, but they don't mean the same thing. And I put them on a continuum. So on one side of the continuum is the pity side where there's power asymmetry embedded in the relationship. So you look down on somebody that you pity, oh, you poor person. But as you make your way across the continuum to empathy, there's a recognition that we share a common humanity. So I refer to empathy as the innate trait that unites us in our common humanity. Like We all have these human characteristics and emotions in common, love, hope, fear, shame. That's what unites us. But the important caveat is that we don't deny or discount people's lived experiences. We don't want to project onto someone. So empathy is what allows us to feel connected. And there's two kinds of empathy. So one of them is affective empathy. It's what touches our hearts. And it is a result of mirror neurons firing in our brains. So for example, when we walk by a park and we hear kids laughing, it kind of puts us in a good mood. If we watch somebody stub their toe, we wince. If we hear, if we listen to a horror movie and with the music on, but then decide to turn the music off, all of a sudden it's less scary. All those things point to our affective empathy. So that's much like compassion, like feeling what someone else is feeling. But then there's cognitive empathy, which is all about perspective taking. So it involves really our neocortex, like imagining what someone else is going through. And I put the emphasis on purposeful empathy because we all have the capacity for empathy but I think we need to dial it up a little bit in terms of how we manage our classrooms, our workplaces, and our public policies. Wow. I never considered pity and empathy on the same line, but that makes sense. I, so I've always thought that you, you can't teach empathy. Like you either have it or you don't. Am I, is that a right or am I wrong? Have I been wrong? Wrong. It's a myth. I really want to debunk. Yeah. We actually, yeah, yeah. Okay. So just like you go to the gym and you do your bicep curls and you pump up your biceps, you can actually become more empathic with practice. So, you know, people are born on this sort of typical bell curve of empathy. There's some people that have a high capacity for empathy and some people a little bit less, but we can all become more empathic. And that's thanks to neuroplasticity. So the more often we think empathic thoughts, the more often we behave in empathic ways, the more we can create thicker neural connections and synaptic connections, and then it becomes more reflective and sort of habitual. And I'll tell you, I'll share a little story with you if you wouldn't mind. When I started learning about the neuroscience of empathy, I started doing all sorts of experiments, you know, paying it forward at the Tim Hortons and all sorts of random acts of kindness just to sort of see what it felt like. And I have a distinct memory being in an office tower uh, in downtown Montreal about 12 or 13 years ago at a FedEx store. So I wanted to send a package, but this was long before we had cell phones to sort of distract us. And because it was the holiday season, it was like 30 minute wait. And I get to the counter and the woman who uh, greeted me was rude. And I don't mean just a little bit rude. I mean, she was nasty rude. And I had a really strong triggered reaction to it. Like, how dare you talk to me like that? But I, because I'd been studying the neuroscience of empathy, I just had a flash and I said to myself, you know, this is a moment where I could practice empathy. And I looked at her and I said, are you okay? And she just took a moment to discern if I was being like kind of passive aggressive or sarcastic. And she knew that I wasn't being. And she said to me, I've, I've she burst into tears first of oh all. Gosh. And she said, I've been working two weeks, double shifts. Um, uh, my son's at home with a fever. I think I'm getting sick. It's three in the afternoon. I haven't had a lunch break. I'm just exhausted. And like 20 seconds earlier, I hated this woman, but then I found myself holding hands with her. We were both weeping, held in this kind of like emotional connection, empathic embrace. So empathy, um, is a superpower because it's available to us if we decide to, to switch it on. 
what happens when I, this is the, the one thing I'm thinking about, I'm still thinking about empathy and pity <laughs> and the fact that I've been wrong this entire time. I've been believing a myth about empathy. So when you, when, when someone is driving, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, I'm thinking about collective empathy, I guess, like as a society where I'm thinking about, you know, we drive down a certain part of town and we see homeless people everywhere. To me, it's outrageous that we live in a country where people have no home uh, or no, you know, they don't have access to health care and that. Is, I thought that if we all had enough empathy, we, we could fix that together. Like, I'm, do you know what I'm trying to say here? Like, I don't understand where does our collective empathy fit in when it comes to, you know, pain maybe or suffering we see in, in our community? That's such an interesting question. Um, well, I want to take it back in time to to mm. mention that um, empathy is actually a trait that allowed us as a species to survive and thrive. So That's some 40,000 years ago, um, people who study our evolutionary history um, told us that, you know, there's about four or five other large brain large brain species that roamed planet Earth around the same time as us, but we're the ones who survived and they ask, why is that? So they studied our physiology and they noticed that relatively speaking, we lost most of our facial hair. Relatively speaking, our testosterone dropped. And the biggest indicator was that the whites of our eyes grew very big. And so we actually are the mammals with the whitest eyes in, yeah. on the. I did that, not know that either. But now that you point that out, that makes sense. Right. And why is that? Well, they surmise that we needed to be able to read each other's facial expressions and collaborate. And so this idea of being able to understand what each other was thinking or trying to express has been part of our evolution. And so I think over time, thanks to sort of the way our society runs, we've lost touch with our natural capacity to empathize. And there's a lot of data points out there that show that we are living in an era of a massive collective empathy deficit. Like, I think it's tragic what you just described about you know, we're living in one of the richest nations on the planet, and yet we have, you know, tens of thousands of unhoused across the country. But I also think it's abhorrent that we have eight men on the planet that have the same combined wealth as half of humanity, right? And there's a bunch of other data points that I could point to. Two billion people don't have access to safe drinking water, a billion people that practice open defecation with huge public sanitation consequences. So, like, I really think that we are trapped in um, a culture, unfortunately, where we are not um, taking enough time to actually sort of think about what other people are going through and doing something about it. So I think, you know, when people ask me, isn't it naive to think that empathy could change the world? I look back and, I, and I, I'm not so naive to say, look, tell people in Ukraine or in Sudan right now, to, you know, we all need to have more empathy for them, right? That they need more than just empathy. I get that. But if you look throughout history, all the social movements, whether it was the salt marches in India or suffrage or civil rights or LGBTQ rights, like all of it required purposeful empathy where people who were allies with people who were suffering to help them sort of achieve more dignity and more equal rights. So I think we need to expand uh, our consciousness. Yes, yes, that makes sense. And I know you're not simplifying it at all, but it does make sense when you take it back and then you look at where we are today and i can i i'm i'm going to guess that things like we're we're more disconnected now and i think that in the last 3 years you know with the pandemic we in some ways you know we became more connected i guess through technology but really it's disconnected yeah and the human as you say the whites of our eyes and the expression and because when you see somebody in person right it changes how we feel. Absolutely. And a little bit more on the brain science of, of empathy is that, you know, that story I shared at the FedEx counter where this woman and I were sort of like locked in an empathic embrace. If I had been hooked up to an fMRI machine or other sort of machines that would gauge how my physiology is doing, there would be a couple of things that, you know, medical science would show. One is that the pleasure and reward centers of my brain would be lit up, just like I'm eating a chocolate cake or I'm high on psychedelics. Like it actually matters to our brain when we are feeling emotionally connected. And then a whole host of physiological changes. So typically, you know, in a stressful society like we live in, we have a lot of cortisol going through our bodies. But when you're feeling emotionally connected to someone, that gets replaced by serotonin and oxytocin. 
So when you talk about the pandemic in the last few years that we've been living through, our brains can't actually be in a state of stress or anxiety and empathy. And we've all been chronically for years now in a state of chronic desire, like anxiety and stress. And so what's happened to our collective empathy is that it's diminished, which is why you're seeing road rage and which is why we're sort of all seeing rates of mental health across the board anywhere on the planet. You're seeing rates go up. So it really matters. Wow. Yes, it makes sense. So back to purposeful empathy. Uh, when someone says to you, what is purposeful em empathy? Can you can you describe it in like in the Coles note version to somebody like your elevator? Your, what do they call it? Your elevator pitch or whatever. But I'm just saying if someone says, well, purposeful empathy, what is that? That we have the natural capacity for empathy, but we can turn it up. We can turn up the volume of empathy in our lives. So that's as simple as smiling to people more often. When somebody has a name badge that you actually refer to them with their name. I mean, the small graces of life, but then also, you know, intentionally going out of your way to help people, not at your expense, though, because I think there's a lot to be said about self empathy and making sure that you take good care of yourself. We're in our society. I know it from my own personal experience, like you do a hard day's work and at the end of the evening, you're thinking about all the things you didn't get to and berating yourself over that instead of the things that you did accomplish. So I think we do need to be kind to ourselves, but purposeful empathy is actually elevating our capacity to empathize. When I think about, you know, you know, challenges that we have right now like let's say in Canada right where you and I are on opposite ends of the country I'm over in BC you're in Quebec right and we still we're our provinces are facing the same challenges you know healthcare challenges homelessness uh, people are still sick um, there's there's stress mental health um, it's all happening when we sometimes and I used to work in news. So I find this interesting because I I really would get too emotionally attached to the stories. And now that I'm not in news, I'm still, I still like to, you know, be up to date and all those sorts of things. And I feel like my, I don't know if it's my empathy or if it's, are empathy and compassion the same thing? So compassion is the feeling what someone else is feeling. So it's the affective empathy, not so much the cognitive empathy, which is perspective taking. So it's imagining what you're in someone else's shoes. Ah, uh, okay. Because I just can't figure out, like, why can't we just all work together? <laughs> why isn't it so simple that we can just all work together to solve the big challenges that we have? Well, is it because some of us don't have empathy? Is it because politicians don't have empathy? Is it like, what is it? Yeah, well, one of there are there are a number of barriers to empathy and one of them is othering. So we naturally as a human species empathize with people who are like us much more easily and we have to overcome that. And what's happening now, unfortunately, is through social media and, you know, hyper polarization is that we are creating camps of us and them. And so it's very difficult to empathize with people who are on the other political divide. Um, and and it's it's tragic because I, I feel like we're at one of those all hands on deck moments in humanity where we have to get, you know, right by climate change, in, income inequality, uh, political polarization, where we have the rise of the tyrants and the authoritarians. And I think that, you know, politicians you know, play to our fears often and play to the camp of let's, you know, put somebody else out as a scapegoat. And we have to rise above that. Again, that's what why I, I refer to purposeful empathy. Let's do it on purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we have kids and, you know, again, I have this myth that I couldn't teach them to be empathetic, but I feel like I have empathetic kids. I feel like I feel like I'm empathetic. What can we do as parents or as aunts and uncles or grandparents when we're around, you know, younger people and we want to encourage them to tap into their empathy, if you will? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I was doing my PhD, I was interviewing dozens and dozens of social entrepreneurs. 
So we know what entrepreneurs are. Social entrepreneurs use the same skills, but they, instead of selling products or services on a marketplace, they want to solve social or environmental problems. So I was interested in these professional change makers. Like why do they spend their lives working on these problems? And I just interviewed them about their lives and they had two things in common. And that was across the board without exception. And I interviewed dozens and dozens of people from around the world at startup, at full scale. I was agnostic to whether they were working on uh, gender inequality or homelessness or race, didn't matter. The two things that they had in common were, and this is what led me down the path of empathy, was that they all felt empathy for others that were suffering or feeling marginalized in some way and couldn't turn a blind eye. So they felt compelled to act on that empathy. But the second thing that they all had in common, which speaks to your question, is that they all had families that modeled service. And so they all grew up with volunteering and this idea of giving back to society and that being modeled in their household sort of became part of their value system. So I think that's a really interesting um, thing to keep in mind if you're trying to raise empathic children to model empathy. Yeah, and you see it often, <clears throat> excuse me, when, you know, a little kid might have a lemonade stand or something. And instead of taking the money they raise and going and buying something for themselves, they donate it to, you know, an animal shelter or, you know, food bank. And, and just that little thing is teaching them something much bigger, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. So you, you, you mentioned your research went, you know, you, you interviewed people around the world. So you interviewed a woman in Turkey, a Turkish woman? Yes, yes, yeah. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, sure. Her name is Elif Gokçidem. She studied, uh, she has a PhD in Islamic art, and she now lives in Washington, D.C., and works with museum curators because she believes that museums are um, public spaces for empathy building. And uh, when I interviewed her, I asked her if there was anything about Islamic art that informed my thinking about empathy, or her thinking, rather, and she said, absolutely. So she asked if I knew anything about geometry. And I said, oh, yeah, OK, I remember my basic grade eight geometry. And so she she had me think about two dots in space connected by a line. And she said, that's the basic geometry. And then you've got three dots connected into a triangle and four dots into a square and da 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 da. She says, now I want you to imagine like on a sheet of paper, a bunch of dots and you connect them, but it's in a shape that has no name. I said, okay, I'm following so far. And she says, well, no, if you take any shape that exists on the planet and you stretch it out to its natural conclusion, they all get stretched out into a circle. So a circle is all encompassing. I said, okay, I'm with you so far. And she says, well, a circle is a great metaphor for empathy for two reasons. The first is a circle is essentially um, an infinite number of dots along the circumference, right? So if you add 10 dots to that circle or 10,000 or 10 million dots, the, so the shape stays the same. It just grows larger. So then she invited me to imagine that all 8 billion of us on the planet were one of those dots along the circumference. And she said, the reason why this is a great metaphor for empathy is that whichever dot you choose all along the circle's circumference, it is equidistant to the center, all of them without exception. And she says, you know, if you're a spiritual person, you might say we are all equally distant to God. If you're a scientist, you'd be equally equidistant to what gives you breath or what is the Big Bang. But there is something about sort of that everyone is inherently and intrinsically worthy by that equidistance. The second thing is no matter where you are positioned on the circle, if you're side by side or you're close by or you're opposite, even though you're equidistant to the center, you see the center differently. So you have a different perspective to the center. So it kind of goes back to this idea that empathy is the innate trait that unites us in our common humanity without discounting lived experience because we all see the world differently. And I've always loved that. I've always loved that. And that makes sense. It's beautiful. Yes, I do love it too. So where does curiosity fit into empathy? Like if we're not curious about others, can we be empathetic? Um, I think curiosity is a great um, trait to have when you are, you know, trying to get to know somebody and trying to hold space. But I actually think um, the, 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 you know, when someone is sharing something important with you, 
curiosity is helpful, but depending on what the the content of that is, you might not want to be asking a lot of questions because sometimes silence is actually more helpful in a circumstance. If somebody's sharing something really tough to share and you're asking a lot of questions, you might actually prevent them from sharing because they feel like, you know, they're under siege with all these curious questions. So I always find that silence is actually um, a really tough thing to engage in because we're kind of in our society allergic to silence. Um, but if we can hold silence, that sometimes invites people to share a little bit more. And another um, another way of holding space for someone and with empathy and, and engaging in empathic listening is perhaps by reflecting back two or three words that you just heard somebody say, um, which sounds maybe mechanical or robotic, but to the person who's speaking about something important, if you just reflect back those few words that you just heard, um, it actually really feels like a bomb to them where you really feel like you're, they're, they're, you know, they feel really heard. So curiosity has its place, but I think silence and, and reflection, reflecting back are really powerful. Yeah, that makes sense, too. I do like that. And you're right. We are allergic to silence in some ways. It's like so uh, silence is uncomfortable, but it can be really beautiful and just the perfect the perfect thing that you need when you're when you're sharing that. Um, so I, I want to ask you, obviously, more about empathy. But before we do that, we like to thank our guests for being here. And we asked them to choose a Canadian nonprofit. You chose the Native Women's Centre in Montreal. Thank you for choosing them. We are going to give them $500 in your name uh, as a thank you for being a guest on um, on the podcast. So thank you for choosing the Native Women's Centre of Montreal. So let's let's talk about how we can be more empathetic when we're stressed. What are some things that we can do? Great. Okay. So I often talk about this case in a workplace scenario. So imagine you're at your desk um, and you've got your computer open and you've got great plans for the weekend. And all of a sudden this email comes in, that says, you know, a client's unhappy or some project's gone sideways and we're going to have to like give up part of our Saturday to like fix this. Right. And a lot of us can, you know, imagine something that kiboshes good plans and you're stressed out about it. And at the same time, you get a knock at the door and it's one of your employees that comes in and says, do you have a minute? So they sit down in front of you and they say, you know, I need to take a few days off because, um, for example, my mom, early stage Alzheimer's, we have to move her into our home and I just need to like be there for her. Right. So let's say you as this uh, empathic leader or want to be empathic leader, know that you're feeling the stress of your own email, but now you need to be present for this person. Well, I just I shared earlier that our brains can't be in a state of anxiety or stress and empathy simultaneously. So the first step I like to share is that we need self-awareness that we're stressed out at all. And we spend a lot of time thinking thoughts and just pretend, like actually paying attention to our thoughts, but we spend near, not nearly enough time listening to the intelligence of our bodies. So if we have sort of butterflies in our stomach or if our cheeks are flushed or if we're feeling parched in our mouth, like all of those are signs that we're stressed, right? Or our shallow breathing. So just the first step of self-awareness, like, oh, I'm stressed is really important in order to self-regulate or down-regulate. So, you know, we if we're feeling stressed, but we want to access empathy, it's a useful, you know, process to sort of like, how can I catch myself so that I can down-regulate a little bit. And one of the fastest ways to do that is through some deep breathing. So you could go with the 555 rule. So you take a deep breath in for a count of five, then you hold for a count of five, and you breathe out for a count of five. And you do that two, three times, and your parasympathetic nerve system is all of a sudden functioning in a less stressful way, which gives you the possibility for empathy to show up. And then the third step is what I call bridge crossing, where you actually decide with intention, so again, purposeful empathy, to leave your own space in order to meet somebody where they're at so that you can hold the space for whatever they're going to tell you about that you can you know, um, be present for them. And so I think all of those things are required. And the more we practice empathy intentionally, the better we get at that. Right. Because it won't be like, oh, I need to, it's like, Tamara, I need to like put this aside. Like, it's not like you're having a whole conversation with yourself. This just becomes a natural thing for you to do. Yeah. Once you've learned you to practice it, it enough. If you practice it. Yeah. 
or you're aware of it enough. Um, I mean, you touched on this earlier. I mean, people think I'm a Pollyanna sometimes with my ideas, but I do think that with more empathy in this world, I do think that we can solve some really big problems. But I mean, we all have to tap into our empathy, into our feelings, into our, you know, is it, it sounds so simple. I, I guess that's why people think that it's, a Pollyanna well, way of looking at life, but I mean, I really do believe it. Right. Uh, one of the stories I write about in the book um, is a woman named Twinkle Rudberg. So she was born Sheila, but she's now known as Twinkle. So she and her husband were out downtown in Montreal uh, for their 25th wedding anniversary. And she was in the passenger seat and they were pulling up a small street where they were looking for a parking space before they were going out for dinner. And they witnessed a young man do a purse snatching and running uphill with a woman's purse. He, she he flipped her over and took off with the purse. And so her husband put the car into park and said, listen, Sheila, like, meet me up at the top of the hill. I'm going to go after that boy and chase him. And sadly, when she got to the top of the hill, he'd been stabbed to death. Her husband was. Oh, my gosh. Right. It was a terrible tragedy. And um, she went to the hearings of this young man and realized that he was a runaway and that his mom, who was a social worker, ironically, was holding down two, three jobs and that he was neglected. But, you know, he was just awash in drugs and just like not doing well. So she actually had empathy for the young man also as a victim of his own circumstances. Now, it wasn't until years and years later um, in the aftermath of the Polytechnique massacre in Montreal where there was a lot more gun control um, legislation being advocated, where one of the victim's sister was on television, you know, actually making the claim for why we need more gun control. And that's when she had a moment, a revelatory moment, where she had always spent, you know, 10 years had passed since her, her husband had died, and um, 10 years had passed since this young man had um, acted in such a violent way, where she still kept him uh, his story in her mind like there are young people at risk of sort of going down the wrong track isn't there something that we could do to help them and so she started with this small little project of um a, a photojournalism kind of after school program working with at risk youth that grew into a nonprofit organization that's in four cities across the country it's called love leave out violence and i share that story because she really turned her own personal pain and trauma into something meaningful with purposeful empathy as its underpinning. And I, I, when I do talks, I, I usually put up uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, that little triangle where when our baseline needs get met, eventually we get to this pinnacle of human achievement, which is self-actualization, right? Like achieving our full potential. Well, just before he died of a heart attack, he actually wrote profusely about how wrong or at least how limited his own model was, because he said, actually, what people really want is past the point of self-actualization. They want to achieve self-transcendence. They want their lives to be of greater purpose than themselves, to either be of service to others. And I think, again, in our culture, um, that is not what is celebrated. You know, it's accumulation. It is popularity. Right. And I think um, I, I think we are our 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 values are, are sort of they get messy. Yeah, they get messy in there somewhere. And I think that, the, again, when we come out on the other side and we get older, like we're in our 50s or 60s and we we then again have a completely different lens on life, right, than we did in those years where we're just trying to somehow we get convinced that we need to accumulate and, uh, and you know, more is better and work is better than relaxing and all those things. And I've seen it over the change, like in the 12 years that I've been teaching um, at McGill. Now, I've got some of the brightest Canadians or international students, I might say, um, from around the world. And over the 12 years, I have seen such a change in how they are in the classroom. Like they're all very smart and very technologically savvy. But one of the activities we do in my class is we do a simple eye gazing exercise. So they sit facing each other with their feet on the floor and their hands, palms up. And it's 30 seconds of eye gazing, not a staring competition. And the only rule is that they can't talk. So sometimes there's some giggling going on and there's like, it's sort of 
very, it takes a lot of courage and there's a lot of vulnerability in that. After the 30 seconds is up, then they maybe like shake it off a bit. They say a few things and then we go into 90 seconds of eye gazing. And what I've witnessed over the years is that there are more and more pairings. These are like students that don't necessarily know each other and they're crying. And at the end, when we do our debrief, they'll share with me that they don't remember the last time they looked into someone else's eyes. And so I think, um, you know, as, as humans, we want to be in communion with each other. We want to have a sense of belonging. That is actually like part of what makes us healthy and happy and have a purposeful life. But our, our lives are kind of by design, you know, do your own thing, be independent. Um, so anything that allows us to, to come back and be sort of in a sense of bonding is, is helpful for us. And when it comes to empathy and, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking about that saying, uh, I, can't, I can't remember exactly how it goes, so I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, you never know what someone else is going through. So be kind sort of thing. Right. And it's true. Right. Sometimes I'll drive and I'll be mad. And I remember a woman hit my car. OK, I was by the hospital. I had a new car. I was super excited. I had a new car because I was in a really bad car accident with my other car. And she just kind of came flying out of not flying, but she came out of an alley and hit my car. I was waiting for a light and I got out and I lost it. I freaked out because I, it scared me. I'd just been in a bad car accident. I lost my marbles. I don't even think she did any damage to my car. She started crying because she had just left the hospital and her mom was in the car and her dad's in the hospital. And that to me was just like, you don't know what someone else is going through like here she is going through this major traumatic event her mom's in the car everybody's upset and then she hits my car which could not have been good for her either so i mean is that something we need to remember that we're all fighting a battle absolutely and um there's a really great practice known as metta meditation so metta m-e-t-t-a is the Sanskrit word for loving kindness. And the way I describe loving, loving kindness is if you're sending somebody loving kindness, what does that look like? It means like if your friend is rushing to get to a meeting, you wish them only green lights, right? Like that's, a, that's a, an act of loving kindness. You just wish people well, happiness, peace, joy, good health. And what you can do is uh, as a little practice, whether you're in the shower or on the way to work or whenever, is to do a metta meditation where you just close your eyes for a couple of minutes. And the first step is you think about people you love and you send them loving kindness. So that's easy to do, right? Then you send as a second step, people you like loving kindness. That's also easy to do. The third step is to send loving kindness to complete strangers, people you'll never meet. And then the fourth one is to send loving kindness to people that may have upset you or hurt you or disappointed you or that you disagree with politically or ideologically. But to your point of we're all fighting our own battles, like that woman at the FedEx counter that treated me rudely, if I had not asked the question, are you okay, I wouldn't have known what she was going through and I would have just assumed she was just nasty as a person. But when I asked her how she's doing and she shared with me, all of a sudden it humanized her and we're all fighting our own battles. But when we're walking around stressed out all the time and we're not wearing our best selves, we're not because we can't access empathy when we're stressed out. So we have to cut each other some more slack. Yes, this has been so great. I What a great conversation and a great book. Um, can you hold it up again, Anita? Uh, Purposeful Empathy. There it is. Anita Novak. You can get that wherever you get uh, your favorite books and you can visit Anita online at Anita Novak. That's N-O-W-A-K dot com. Anita, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tell Us Talks with Tamara Taggart. Be sure to subscribe so you can join us every Tuesday for another conversation. You can also check out our website, tellus.com slash podcast and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Telus Talks. 